Today we have two presentations. Uh, Gary Patrick's going to talk a little bit about uh, some Windows stuff. Correct, Mr. Patrick? That's correct. I have a couple of topics dealing with Windows applications. Good. And that will be followed by uh, Mr. Sistokis going to talk about some hardware and how to prevent fires in your home. A little, bit more, a little bit more than that. Okay, I thought so. <clears throat> you know, stay tuned, stay tuned. It'll wake everybody up. There we go. I'm just trying to give you a headline so that you can, you know, okay. news it, film, film at 11. To protect uh, in, inadvertent uh, discussion, uh, I'm going to mute everybody's microphone <coughs> except the speaker. And if you do want to say something, feel free to unmute it. So I'll mute it now. And uh, now, first of all, i got to find uh, Peter and unmute him. All set. You got it. Okay. Good. So, uh, uh, Gary, uh, since we can't see you and I don't know if what's going on, how do you yes. want to handle questions and stuff like that? Do you want people to, since you can see everybody, do you want them to raise their hand or just interrupt you or wait to the end? What do you prefer? Uh, I'd say um, raise their hand. I'll turn on the chat feature here. Actually, I'll point out that there is a chat window. If you look on the bottom of the screen, you'll see it says chat. And uh, if you click on that, it should be in color right now because I put a message out there. If you click on that, you can type your questions, which is uh, one way to pass a message along to the speaker. And I guess that's about it. Uh, 32 people, a nice turnout. Thank you all for uh, taking the time. And... Uh, Let's pull the pin, Gary. All right, so I need to share my screen here to get my slides up. Uh, so I'll do that. And um, what I want to take is this, the potpourri slides, uh, and share. <clears throat> OK. Um, this is a, a collection of uh, a couple of topics. Let me move right to the second slide, <clears throat> actually three. I thought I would mention first that the Ask Woody newsletter is resuming a free edition, although I tried to get a, a sample of that to show you. Um, and what I found was a fairly early one, um, nothing more recent, but I can show you. Uh, wait a minute, something is interfering here with my there we go, that's better. <clears throat> I'm trying to get to uh, my email in order to be able to share that newsletter. Um, well, let's skip that for the moment. It seems to be a you little- want me to walk you, you want me to walk you through it, Gary? It's not that hard. <clears throat> well, what I did, I've got the, uh, the picture that I'm showing. All right, wait a minute, I can move this down a bit. All right, let's see if I can get to this now. There, does that show or have I lost the share? No, you're still sharing the, uh, um, so now you have, to un, you have to unshare and then share again. Actually, you don't, you don't. Uh, okay. if you go oh. to, if you go to the top of the screen, you should, you should get a, a bunch of menus that, and one of them says share screen, just like you had on the bottom. Yep. And if What's... you click, click on the share screen, the green button, and it'll give you choices and it'll just flip over to the uh, uh, this new screen that you want to share. Okay. New share, this one. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. All right. So now do you see the, no. the Ask Woody newsletter? Negatory. Oh, dear. All right. So let's, uh, let's do it virtually. <clears throat> Um, well, let me go back to what I had. And that's all we see now on the screen. Uh, okay. All right. Well, I'll come back later and show you the free newsletter. Um, but anyway, I'm right that the, the new edition will show you um, two or three articles a week out of four or six that would appear in the, um, the, the Ask Woody 
newsletter plus edition that asks for a, an annual donation. But it's definitely worth having. Um, it deals with Windows 10 and also Windows 7 and Windows 8. And there have been articles about um, helping people make the transition from Windows 7 to something else, not only Windows. It also talks about Chromebooks and uh, Linux and so forth. So it's a nice, a nice newsletter. Okay, topic number two is about encryption software. Um, I extracted this from an article on Windows Newsletter uh, that uh, talks about encryption software, but he begins with the question of why would you want it? And the, the real question is when you store data in the cloud, is it safe there from prying eyes? And is it, is, is it going to persist there even after you remove those files from the cloud? And the answer is, is probably yes, that your data will live on because it takes a while for a cloud provider to decide that it really is not of any use anymore in considering their needs as well. <clears throat> Um, you know that if you have files located locally uh, and delete them on your PC, it doesn't actually delete the data from your hard drive. It simply changes the, the tables that locate that data so it's no longer accessed. Uh, but the data still exists on your hard drive, it's just hidden. And the same is true for data in the cloud. I'll let you read on here that the, the, those files can remain for quite some time. I will post these slides so that actually you'll have full access to be able to study all of this material on your own. The fact that if your files are on somebody else's server, they really have control of it, the retention period and so on. And in some cases, I'm reading down the middle, of, um, for legal reasons, a cloud service provider may decide that they need to hang on to old data for quite a long time. But if you use encryption, you have a way of controlling how visible that data is after you're done with it and would just as much, just as, as soon have it deleted. That is, if you encrypt your files before you upload them, it won't matter at all where they end up because nobody will be able to read them. Only you have the key. <clears throat> I might ask, um, on the screen view that you have, are these extra boxes showing up over on the right-hand side? Are they interfering with the display at all? Yes, a little bit. Yep. A little bit. Yeah, I'm seeing them too. Um, we see the chat. We see part of the chat window. You might want to minimize your chat window. Gone. All right. Much better. Uh, okay, I'm just looking at the, the chat. Um, Peter or uh, I will relate anything will, that comes across the chat. Uh, so okay, the, uh, then I'll minimize that to get rid of it. Yeah, we'll take. Okay. We'll, we'll pass it along. And I don't know what I do without the participant window. All right, that's good. Now we've got the participant window out too. So, <clears throat> this article in Windows uh, in Ask Woody newsletter uh, talked about. Uh, several ways to accomplish encryption. One way is to use tools that are already inside of uh, applications that you probably have. Microsoft Word, so you use OneDrive, the, the cloud-based vault for that. And uh, there's a way there to encrypt files. And I'm posting this user guide that'll show you how to do that. And then down at the bottom um, in Microsoft Office, that also offers a way to encrypt files. 
and here's the uh, the way to do that, or an example of what you get uh, as a way of protecting your documents by encryption and setting a password. <clears throat> so there are still some disadvantages to using encryption that's built into a, an application. You're trusting the, the skills and policies of the provider and the encryption isn't really truly under your control. So let's look at some third party encryption apps that really do put you in charge. And the first it's probably pretty well known is 7-Zip. Um, and Fred Langa, who wrote the article, did also post this link um, that's a Google search to find other encryption software. And what comes up as part of that are two articles in PC Mag and Tech Radar that are reviews of a number of encryption programs. And here's the list that they come up with. Um, but there's another one that I discovered, Boxcryptor, that they didn't address, but it has been recently added to the Ask Woody Ultimate Utilities list, which is where I found it. And then I also found a review of Boxcryptor because it looks pretty good. And so I summarized the strengths and weaknesses of that here from this article that's posted. And although Boxcryptor was designed, I guess, for cloud storage, it can in encrypt local files. Works from within Windows File Explorer, as well as in within its own application window. Mounts a vir virtual drive so that your files and folders will show up as a hard drive along your others, with your others. And you have a choice of encrypting single files or a folder, or a whole drive. Uh, let's see, let's go back. Um, the one thing that's a bit of a limit though, is that you can use it on only two devices and can sync with only one cloud storage provider. There is a paid version that'll give you a wider use range but there's caution here that their pricing is a little strange. And I have not looked into that. Okay. <clears throat> then the next few slides are summaries of the other encryption programs that were written up in PC Mag or Tech Republic pointing out the editor's choice in each case. So there's folder lock. Um, all of, of these, I think, it's, except the last one I'll get to, do require an annual payment. There's AxeCrypt Premium, $42 a year. And certain safe. Another one. That's, this one is quite expensive, however, so it's probably not working worth looking at it in, in great detail. And Nordlocker, which is lesser known, I believe. And another paid one, Intercrypto. And crypto expert that uh, Tech Radar still liked pretty well, but wasn't written up in PC Mag. 
$60 a year. And it's a Windows only program. And then finally, Veracrypt, which is free. And I did find a review of Veracrypt. So let me do a new share of this screen. Uh, let's see, do I have to New share. Okay, I see. I have to click this button. I think maybe that's what I missed before. Yep. Okay, is this showing now of a ghacks, ghacks.net page that's a, a review of Veracrypt? Yes, it is. And it seems to be quite detailed. It goes walks through the installation and how to use it. Preparations gives you good screenshots. So I'll let you study this on your own time at home, but it certainly looks like another nice alternative in addition to BoxCrypt. Go back to my slide set. Okay. <laughs> and both our tech radar goes on and continues to name still more. You'll have this slide set to be able to look at these if you wish. Good file encryption is really the only way to keep your private files stored online truly private, even when they're no longer in your possession or under your control. You just lose the key so that nobody can can read anything that's in there. Okay, so now I'll change topics to back to the Ask Woody newsletter. One of the Gary, things they've had, yes. Before you change topics, just a, just a quick clarification. Sure. These, these tools encrypt the file locally and then store it on a server or, uh, or they just they encrypt it on the server or how did, what's, what's going on there, just at a very, very high level? Um, you have a choice. You can encrypt a file and leave it encrypted on your PC, or if you move it or copy it from your PC to a cloud service provider, then it's, it's encrypted there. And it's encrypted during transit as well, so that no hacker or middleman can, can see it or see the material while it's en route. That's Great, the thanks. advantage. Are there differences in performance hits from the uh, encryption and decryption, or, or is it noticeable at all? I don't know. I expect it takes some processing power in your PC, yes. Anybody want to comment on that? Does anybody use encryption now to be able to I've, give... Um, I've used XCrypt on my Windows PCs for years. Um, encryption, decryption of moderate uh, size files um, is um, not quite instant, but a fraction of second. I mean, if you were encrypting, you know, a gigantic video a file, it might uh, take a noticeable hit from it. for any normal size file that I've worked with. Um, it's uh, fractions of a second. Okay, thanks, Bob. Any other questions? All right, let's move on. Um, as I was saying, Woody Leonard uh, has taken over what used to be the Windows Secret Newsletter and for years, that's kept a list of favored utilities to recommend to people, and they keep doing updates on it. And this article 
in Ask Woody newsletter was kind of interesting because it gathered comments and suggestions from newsletter readers. Number one, here's an alternative to CCleaner that uh, one user likes in, in particular. And item two, bleach bit, another portable and free cleaning utility. Portable means that you can load it on a USB drive, thumb drive, and move it around from one PC to another, which is kind of handy. The third item, another search facility to use instead of uh, instead of Google or DuckDuckGo is supposedly uh, a search utility that uh, doesn't gather your personal information for um, targeting you with ads. So Start Page is another one that uh, sterilizes your search a bit so that you won't get tracked for ads. Item four, tree size. I believe this has been mentioned within our meetings in the past. Nice way to keep track of where your um, storage capacity is getting used up on your hard drive. What files are larger than you may have expected. And uh, number five is a photo editing tool. Earthen View, I think, will be familiar to a number of us. I remember when Al Sherman first introduced that to us years ago. But ACDC Photo uh, does require an annual fee. And then finally, uh, number six is a backup utility for your Outlook mail data. And finally, directory opus item seven as a substitute for Windows File Explorer, but unfortunately you have to pay for it. And then uh, the ultimate utilities list really begins with a list of 10 things that the editors there favor as things to install on your PC uh, as really important applications. Things that uh, are pretty indispensable these days. So here's that list. Um, <clears throat> the third one, Dropbox, although he says reluctantly, here, I don't know quite what he means by that, why? And I did do a search within the Ask Woody newsletter forum last night to see if there were any comments about Dropbox that would explain why he's reluctant. And I didn't, did not find anything. So Barry, do you, yes. I think it might be because the free version is limited in terms of uh, storage. Okay. So so that you then if you really want to do a lot of work on Dropbox, you have to pay some money. I see. Okay. Comments about uh, Apple iTunes. There's a lot of uh, buzz that uh, people hate it, and uh, it, it seems not to work particularly reliably on the PCs, uh, at least in my experience. Uh, anybody uh, want to comment on that? I can comment. Um, um, I used, uh, I have iTunes running with um, um, synchronization of uh, uh, contacts and emails running on uh, uh, my iPhone, my iPad, um, my uh, laptop, and my desktop, both of which are Windows 10 machines. Um, comment, um, iTunes for Windows is an absolute memory hog and uh, will not run stably unless you have uh, significantly more than the minimum amount of memory on your machine. It also, um, if you make the mistake of having 
antivirus um, or internet security protocols running uh, the in, at the time of install, the install may get uh, really hopelessly screwed up. Uh, and I've had that happen uh, with Norton. And I now know enough that whenever there's an iTunes update, disable Norton, run the update, re-enable it. And uh, well, since I started doing that, I've had no problems with it. But it is a little funky. Hey, Bob, in, in contrast to that, I use iTunes as well, but I don't use a third-party antivirus. I just use Defender. Okay. And, uh, I've updated I, uh, iTunes without any problem. Good. Okay, I'll move on. The ultimate utilities list continues. Oh, first, Fred wants to issue some notes about uh, being careful about downloading free utilities. Be sure you have a current system backup before running an app to install something. Particularly true of system cleaners and performance enhancer software. Um, they point out that there's a, a site called oldergeeks.com where the organization running that is pledged to avoid including tag-along software or malware. All right, now on with the list. Organized by the kind of software that it is. General utilities, um, team viewer, we've talked about uh, certainly a lot in our, our group as a way of sharing control of your PC with another person for troubleshooting or uh, meeting or whatever. Privacy badger down at the bottom. It's almost an ad blocker, not quite. What it does is block tracking cookies. And I've had that running for some time and it seems to be pretty good. Occasionally, it uh, causes a website to not behave quite right. For example, if you have a, a website that wants to put up a pop-up for you to fill in some information. Sometimes the pop-up doesn't appear and you have to go in and turn off Privacy Badger for that site in order to use it. So there is that caution, but otherwise I've liked it. Back to the previous slide, uh, has anyone had sure. with the Mythic Soft Agent Ransack? That sounds really repugnant. Uh, do, do we really want that? A search engine. I don't know. I haven't used it. I have no familiarity with that. Somebody ought to talk to the marketing department about naming software. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Drive diagnostics and management. Password managers. Um, I'll point out that uh, one password is now the top choice by Consumer Reports magazine. That article came out online just within the last month. And if you really need uh, an online or an on-demand antivirus scanner, these are good choices. You know, to get a second opinion, let's say, on um, whether or not your PC has a virus problem. So you would run one of these in addition to the antivirus that you already have installed on your machine. And the two free encryption software programs that I talked about previously. 
And to finish, a couple of little bonus items here that I found in the Ask Woody newsletter. There's a forum thread that began in January about how to stand a, set up a standard user account in Windows 10 uh, so that you use that instead of an administrator level account. It's just safer from a security point of view. And then there's this article about backup imaging software. A number of people comment and they seem to like Macrium Reflect about the best over terabyte. Actually, terabyte is one I'm not aware of, but certainly Acronis has been mentioned a lot in our meetings as well. Okay, any questions? I have a question about the uh, Ask Woody. Yes. Is it uh, Windows only or does it deal with uh, Linux or Mac? I know that they have something on the Chromebook right now, but I'm wondering, is everything that they put there, utilities and so forth, all geared towards Windows or what? Mostly Windows, but not entirely. Let me see if I can share this screen now that I wanted to do before. New share right here. Click on it. Okay, so now you should have a view we see of the Ask, Woody. the Ask Woody free newsletter. Now, this was from January, and it's the most recent sample that I was able to pull up. <clears throat> but uh, this will show you that um, his policy is going to be to show you about three articles for free that would you'd get to see more if you make an annual contribution to support them. Welcome to the, the free newsletter. I think this may have been the first that they resumed the free one. And then right here, here's a topic that's not about Windows. It's along the theme of helping Windows 7 users decide what to do to get off of Windows 7. You go to Windows 10, go to a Chromebook or a Chromebox or a Linux system. So some of their emphasis now um, is on helping you with other operating systems, but mostly still about Windows. Okay, if there are no other questions, that concludes my presentation for the morning. Gary, thank you very much. Let's do a uh, little applause there for him. Well done. Can I, can I ask a question? No. <laughs> no, he's still alive. Hi, one. George. Give him a question. He can have a question. Yeah, hi, hi George. Course, he, can question. he can ask it. I, I typed it out on your, uh, but I didn't do it verbally. Uh, what is this standard uh, uh, user account? A standard user account simply means an account that has somewhat limited um, capabilities. The, the admin account, the administrator level account, you can go in and change anything within Windows. You can change settings, you can delete files and all of that. Um, the trouble is that that same level of access is also granted to um, communications coming in from outside. Um, so that a hacker can get into your PC. If you're using your administrative account, a hacker can conceivably get into your PC and change things within the Windows operating system uh, that he wouldn't be able to do if you were using a standard account that locked out some of those abilities. Actually, I'd, I'd like some commentary from Bob Eckert or Bob Primack about um, 
the security within the Windows system. I believe they've, either of them knows more about it than I do and can help uh, comment on this question of standard account versus admin account. All right, I That's, can tell you something. I can tell you something about a standard user account. Standard users do not have absolute privileges to install software and they do not have absolute uh, access to uh, files and system areas, which an administrator or super administrator would have. Uh, that prevents a lot of stuff that comes through the browser from doing stuff on your local machine. It's not foolproof, and that's one reason Windows 10 introduced restricted folders or folder access restrictions. That's an anti-ransomware protection which was added. And uh, you have to activate the restricted folders in Windows 10. It's in settings. Thanks, Bob. Bob. I, I, uh, Bob, I think you had a fairly long discussion about this a couple of years ago before you uh, decided to leave us and move to uh, greener pastures. Am I correct? Um, I had a, a kind of a long discussion uh, about uh, security and encryption and uh, that presentation, uh, the last I looked was still up um, on the website. Uh, and let me add that um, in terms of the standard account versus the admin account, um, I personally like to run with an admin account and accept um, the risk, just like I like to ride my bicycle and I accept the risk that I might uh, get hurt. But the advantage of the standard account uh, for someone who doesn't fully know what they're doing is it protects you from yourself. It always asks you, do you really want to do this? Do you want to grant uh, privileges? And in some cases, like installing software, you're going to have to go to uh, log out, go into the admin account and run, um, which is uh, really a good protection uh, for folks that uh, might inadvertently install software. You know, I just, I just helped a friend here at Rivermead, very knowledgeable person, professor of infectious uh, diseases at uh, a renowned university who ended up getting schnookered uh, into installing ransomware on his computer. He's exactly the kind of person who absolutely should have been running on a standard account. So, Yeah, Bob, in Linux, we always run in a limited account. We don't run as root. Just, just to add on top of that, the way I operate is I have two accounts. I, I, I uh, do have a user account, which is where I am now. And uh, that's where I do all my work. And I have the ad admin account, which is just for that purpose. It's more or less like being a corporate environment where the IT department locks down your computer and that uh, you can't do anything and that uh, you, you know, it protects you from yourself. Absolutely. I find, that, I find the biggest problem that I have, which is a non-problem, is when I need to update software, Windows 10, which is what I run, asks me for the admin password. And if I put the admin pass password in, because at that point I know it's trying to do something, I have a choice and I say yes or I say no. And I feel comfortable it is protecting me from myself. And, you know, I'm not necessarily a, a novice user, but at the same time, I'm human. I know I can make a mistake. Peter, I, when it comes to the UAC, that only allows you to do a single operation. I, if you need to do anything more extended, that's where I go into the administrator account. Agreed. Uh, like, like once a month to do maintenance. Right. If there's something that comes up or something something that I have to do, you know, clearly I'll log into the uh, uh, admin account and do that work. But I also... 99% oh, of day-to-day -day stuff, don't need it. Yeah. Oh, day-to-day, -day, it's absolutely dangerous to run in a, as an administrator. I In Linux, you don't run as root, so that's not a problem. It's always standard user. But uh, in Linux, we have a command line uh, terminal, which is all text, very DOS-like. And there we can run an extended session and do multiple commands and multiple installs as root and still right, not wanna, get out of that protected environment. I don't want to cut into Charlie's time. 
Oh, uh, sure. I'm going to refer people to uh, Steve. How, how did how do they get to uh, Bob's presentation that was uh, that was done a while ago about this? It's all uh, all of these are on the wiki that I've been maintaining. I've been maintaining it uh, for over a year and a half now. Um, I'll put it in the uh, I'll put it in the chat window. If you go there, you can see all the presentations, uh, videos for many of them, slide sets for many of them as well. Good. All right. So just, no, just, no. just a fast shot. Yes, I've please. With those ten, which one do I have, and which one should I have? Ask that again, George, please. I've just got Windows 10. Which kind of account do I have? You probably have an admin account if you haven't done anything to change it. I One comment. If you did the standard install of Windows 10, you will have an admin account, which is tied to your Microsoft account in the cloud, unless you specifically did something to make it a local account. And that introduces other issues, which are mostly privacy oriented. Yeah. Now I've got a question for later. Okay. Charlie, it's yours. Thank you. I want to add to that. You make the admin account a local account and you have just about everyone else have a regular standard account and the people who need to know uh, how to, do things as admin, they have the admin password, at least you have a chance if something comes in and through whatever it is that you're doing, they'll, you'll have some kind of a pop-up or whatever, they'll say, we want to do such and such, and you ask yourself, why? Why is that? And it's a safety thing. In fact, Microsoft is putting that out as information uh, that I've seen all along. And George, yes, you are the most dangerous person. You will, if it reaches that point, you will blow up your own machine. Sorry. Okay, over to me. Um, please, please mute your microphones, please, if you haven't. Oh. Um, no, not you. I'm sorry. Don't You're all set, Charlie. You're all set, Charlie. Go oh. ahead and share your screen. I'll okay. monitor the microphones and uh, mute them as necessary. Excellent. Thank you. Good timing, good timing. Um, I was fortunate enough to get uh, some training from Peter yesterday. I want to give him a big hand um, about screen sharing. And after I left, I said, I think I need to do video sharing from my camera much, much more than uh, I would do as Gary did which was the screen sharing. So if you're going to see me, I'm going to be doing the equivalent of a dog and pony show, uh, holding up stuff and so on. Um, so the most, I'm going to do them in order of priority. Priority, um, SSDs, solid state disks. Do you have slides, I, Charlie? Pardon? Do you have slides that you're looking at? Right now, no. Okay, when you do, if you share them, we can watch them as you talk. Oh, okay. I don't have them, however... Most of this is verbal and sharing with people, and I'm watching their reaction. Uh, SSDs, um, three options. It's a good thing. SSDs make my computer run faster. That's one option. Another option is SSDs don't make my computer run faster. Uh, or there's a third one, which is neither faster nor slower. The first one, who thinks that you install an SSD, solid state disk, it makes my computer run faster? Just put up your hands if I can. Okay, so at least a good bunch of people. How about if you put in an SSD and it makes uh, my system run slower? Anybody think that? Okay. How about the third option, which is it does neither it neither run, makes it run faster or slower anybody think that bob ah the one person uh this has been asked by other people if you put in an ssd yes as as long as you're doing disk io you see things move real fast and as soon as that over and let's say you're running word or some power presentation or whatever you are not doing disk operations, you're doing memory and whatever else, you are back to 
whatever the capability of your computer. In other words, at that point, the SSD is in no way speeding up the upper. In other words, if you had a slow machine, you're still going to have a slow machine when you're doing that. So just a little small item. Um, if somebody hasn't included SSDs, you're okay. It's good. However, if you've got a slow machine, if you're going to, you think you're going to improve the actual speed of the basic computer, you're in for a shock. It's small item. However, um, whoever your tech support person is, I hope they're thinking along those lines. Uh, next one, I'm jumping ahead. Let me see if I can, let's see if this can be shown. This is an AC power outlet, okay? The normal uh, outlets attaching and the newer ones, you have to go look for them. Instead of using a power block, you have three for USB and another one for the USB-C uh, device. Okay. Why am I bringing it up? This is not my personal experience, but other people's experiences. Um, they come to the end of the day. Uh, this really happened. Everybody comes home, and maybe one or two people by themselves. doesn't matter that much, but if you have a larger crew, everybody heads to the chargers, whatever you have. And they put them on because in the morning, they are ready to use their devices, and they count on everything being charged up. One fellow came home, everybody's, uh, all their equipment are on chargers. He's in the kitchen doing some work. He turns around, half of the wall in the kitchen is on fire. He went and he grabbed a fire extinguisher that he got for a Christmas holiday gift. And he used it by the time he caught up with it and had the fire engine down, half of the kitchen was burned up. This is not the thing that we usually run into. However, the little item that I held up here is insurance. Why insurance? Or how did that fire start? Um, there's no guarantee of the power blocks that we attach to the outlets on the wall, if that's how you attach them, of overheating. And sure enough, that was a situation where just being in near proximity to the wall was just started up and the wall caught on fire and uh, it happened. I've not heard of anything happening in the near area. However, my suggestion from the lesson from all of that is go out if, in other words, if you're really plugging into the wall, you got a little slow, small blocks, you're, you're pretty much safe. However, if you're getting some of the newer hardware and they have larger power blocks, some of them will go up to 100 watts. And a power block that's delivering 100 watts out of it can really, really heat up. And you wouldn't expect it to have a problem. And you'd expect that the circuit breaker would trip. And that's not a guarantee. And then Peter <laughs> suggested, he said, well, wait a minute. That's what we've got the smoke detectors and all of those kind of things. And I didn't think of it, Peter. What, what happens to the people have hearing problems and they take their hearing aids out and they can't really hear the alarms go off and if they're falling asleep. So this is more of a safety thing. We, we all have fire insurance policies on our houses for safety and some of the newer equipment that's coming along, you have to do a little bit of thinking and the cheap way out is you, out, you go out and buy a power strip and you know, you get a three foot, four foot or a two foot piece of wire and you move it away from the wall and ch sure your uh, chargers will still get warmed up and they could potentially cause a problem. However, if they're not near anything that's combustible, then you're just providing yourself a little extra protection. I don't know if anyone wants to do or have a little extra protection. I would strongly recommend just 
taking a look and considering uh, what you have. So that's the important items that I have. Uh, let me see. Uh, now, I have a tale that I personally have gone through. Buyers, in the end, it was buyer's remorse. And what I did was I bought what I thought, and this is a full-blown Windows 10 machine. However, it's a little bit slow. And I, what I wanted was I can't get it on an iPad. I can't, well, Chromebook is something else. I wanted to have local storage and anything that runs Windows 10 has local storage. Then the fun began. Okay, you, and the reason why I'm going into this is Apple started out and right now with not all, but most equipment, they have, and I'll see if I can hold this up. There's a USB-C uh, type of connection. And let me see. No, I guess I'm not going to do it too well. It's one of those where you can plug it in upside down. And this machine only has one of them. Everything that has to go in and out of this laptop, which is not quite like Microsoft Surface, but, you know, the hand waving is, well, okay, we'll, we'll manage. We'll manage. So with that unit I have, you get in a box. Here's your charger. Uh, I don't know. And then you say, well, what if I lose that charger or whatever? So what you do is you hike it down to some store and you get yourself a USB-C cable. Uh, so that's what I did just to put it down conveniently so I don't have to go find an AC power plug. So not much, not much. This is, you know, five to seven dollars kind of a thing. Now, uh, how do I print from this device? Uh, well, let me see. I have a bunch of stuff. They, they call them dongles. Uh, you can get a dongle like this. It's a little mini uh, size. One side plugs into the USB-C. The other side gets you a regular USB connection. So you can attach, well, maybe something that will expand that. Or you can get something that's a little bit longer in case you didn't want to have a force coming down on the side of whatever you have there, uh, so on. Okay, so I can do printing. I can attach this. I can install a printer. Uh, so far, buying these things, you can get them on eBay as long as they're simple. These are simple devices the price isn't that high. However, if you start looking at eBay, uh, Amazon, you'll find that most of them will say they're compatible with Apple devices. Then you start looking at what about Windows? I've got Windows 7 or I've got Windows 10. Some of these items, as they increase in complexity, they don't say anything at all about Windows support. They just make the illusion, well, you know, buyer beware. And the other item that you, on a, a tablet like that, is you, you really need to go buy a stylus. My fingers just can't get in that small, uh, so on. Now, let's say you, if you don't do any kind of a, a additional work, you don't do a printer, you don't add files, but you still want to have a um, presentation, which means a larger screen. Uh, now you want a dongle. Forget all of these. There, there's a basic problem with, with all of this, where one end is the USB-C, the little one, and the other end is an HDMI output. The complexity in this little box here, most of them only work 
for Apple. You think you can go buy the other one and hook it up. This is not a passive device. Um, this actually I bought used, but this comes from the Microsoft store. The other dongles are usually like, I don't know, 10, $15. They're relatively cheap because they say, well, by the time you throw everything together, you're around $70. Uh, you have to really think about it. This little item cost me just about as much as the Windows 10 tablet. And it's controlled by Microsoft. Uh, and even then, the display is so-so. So now you want all of this stuff to work. In other words, you're out on the road or wherever with the tablet, doing your work, you come back, and you don't want to squint at a little small screen. My eyes after a while are just really overloaded. You start looking for another solution, either on eBay or on Amazon. And they sell you these things. Well, I should have gotten the picture that, that shows it's about, about the size of your hand and it's got all of these dongles attached, and they tell you right off the bat that this works with Apple. And it is, because most of the newer devices are gonna be like this. Everything is thin, uh, the battery's included, you've gotta charge the battery, and the battery charging takes a bit of power, this is one of those where your chargers are not small. Um, your keyboard, how does one work and live with Apple equipment like this? This is what, well, I haven't been to the Apple store. It's closed. Uh, so, in other words, you blame the USB-C, even though it's got a lot of capabilities, it has come into being, if you will, through the, the Apple side, not the Windows side. But Windows is kind of following in their footsteps. Nice equipment. You can portable. It's small. There's no room to put anything with the exception of this unit here does have the capability of attaching to a dock. And on the dock, you hope everything works. The short of what I've picked up is the following. If you do buy equipment like this, even if they give you two USB-C, one of them you can do charging and the other one uh, would be for printer support. Another one would be for hooking up to a screen. In other words, you're now sitting there trying to do some work and you're not carrying the big, big laptops around. Uh, and so on. Uh, so now the suggestion is you can try certain models from um, Amazon, Newegg, you name it, and eBay. And you finally come to uh, the following conclusion. The only thing that works is if you buy something from HP, you go back to HP and you get the complete solution from HP because they guarantee that it works. And that's what I had to do. In other words, in my hand here, again, this is about my hand size, you get their solution. Some of it is microcode. Some of it is software that's actually loaded in to the Windows 10 side so that when you go out to these devices, everything works. Oh, and by the way, you also get another power block that has to provide power to both charge and use the unit. So after a while, you have, you have a, a tablet and you wind up with a, an all-purpose, this guy here provides all kinds of USB, HDMI, Ethernet, um, 
and so on. So if you don't do this, if you try to mix and match, you're going to be in for some surprises. The surprises, well, you know, you'll be able to return, hopefully. Um, and maybe you'll get your money back or not. Uh, but if you look at buying some new equipment, the new stuff is lovely. It's really great. I mean, you, you know, you can't help but not look at it. You go into the Microsoft store, when they open up again, uh, those Surface units, I mean, the prices are just as high almost as the Apple stuff. And they really do a tremendous amount of stuff. I've gone to all the uh, Microsoft meetings and the people are just pulling the units out. And, you know, you can't help but say, I want to have one until you go into the details and then you find out all of these items that used to be there on the edge of the mobile stuff, whether it's your laptops, well, they're on the phones. You look on your phone, how many IO connectors do you have on it? There are some others, you don't even have a connection. Uh, so in my case, the buyer's remorse is I started out, I can still use the device but I have a mess of stuff um, that could be good, could be bad. Um, it, if I had it, in other words, I, I had to go through a learning process and I'm trying to share with anyone that says, uh, if you do, you have to no longer evaluate what you're buying as to what the CPU, the solid state disk, the memory, in other words, all the innards of the machine, you start looking, how am I going to use this from the outside? Because the only way they can package this is it gets thinner and thinner and they have no choice. They can't put any more additional connectors. Um, the biggest item is when there's an internal battery and the only way you can keep it going is through a charging port. And how do you do it? And of, of course, nobody asks about this at the beginning until after you've lived with it for a while. Anyone going to be buying any new equipment? I mean, a lot of the Apple now has a five-year policy. A lot of the other companies, Dell, HP, they haven't had it. In other words, I, I've uh, converted some Dell stuff, 10-year-old stuff that runs Windows 10. I was shocked. It shouldn't be doing it, but it does. Uh, Chromebooks, uh, same. There's a five-year rule. After five years, you're on your own software-wise. So it's nothing to get terribly shocked about stuff that we have after five. That's the rule that people are coming out with. After five years, you walk in to some place to get it repaired. Uh, you may run into problems. Um, in other words, it's sort of like we're building stuff that's going to have a five-year lifetime. After five years, go away. Go away. It's like having a five-year-old car. After five years, you're on your own. I mean, you expect to get at least 10, 15 years out of a car today. So the... The world isn't coming to an end. However, uh, that's what I've seen. Anybody that wants to raise a hand, uh, ask anything about this. Maybe I've overlooked some items. Or do you plan on not getting a new, new computer, but even a year too old? Will you be sort of really interested in you know, they call them all the ports. Do you care about the ports? They should all be there. Yes, Jerome. Uh, I think that the, the issue comes up with how much backward compatibility do you really need to have when the technology changes? So it's like when you go from a buggy to a car, do you really want to still have a horse? And that, I mean, that's their claim. And that they're, they're uh, now they don't mind if you buy a new piece of equipment, don't get me wrong. But but their concept that they at least promote is that is really a new piece of equipment. And to make it uh, uh, backwards compatible 5, 10, 15 years would take you back to the Apple II. And 
they, they just don't think that that's a very practical way to, to approach fast-moving technology. Whether people agree with that, I don't know, but that's what they say. Well, let me add to that. Um, when did Windows 10 come out? It came out in 15, right? Sounds right. Yeah. They got rid of the DVDs. They said, we're not, we're not going to support DVDs and so on, even though you've yeah. got equipment with DVDs, you know, get your own video players and so forth. They, you know, uh, it, it is what it is, but it's not new technology. Or if I've got printers or some other devices that you really count on, uh, I mean, over in the Apple land, they count upon all their, you know, multimedia work. And some of that multimedia work requires certain things. So it's how to make that all work. In other words, you have to wind up adding external stuff on. The remorse that I have out of all of this, by the way, is just that I don't want to put up with all the wiring. I want a lot of the stuff that was there. In other words, don't delete it all. And their answer is we can't make it thinner. We can't provide you. What you really want is a you know, three, four, maybe even five year ago stuff new, which, which is true. Uh, and the, 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 the item uh, in a minute, Peter. And then, yes, the question is the operating system, the software capability of backwards compatibility, but these items are just there. They should be there. Peter. A the, the couple of things. Basically, what, you, what you've demonstrated is what all of us have known for a while that have been using laptops is that in order to use them, a docking station, if you will, to use an old phrase, is really right. a very valuable piece of equipment. Because by definition, laptops to be smaller and portable have to make some sacrifices. And when you compare it to a desktop that had all this stuff built in, you have to make some changes. And so the docking station is a nice middle ground. And, and I believe basically what you did from, with HP is you bought, bought their docking station, for, if, I, if I can use that term for all intents and purposes. The other issue with, uh, with the hardware and software is that as the soft, as the hardware gets more sophisticated, the software sometimes doesn't keep up. I mean, the, uh, the newest hardware doesn't, doesn't necessarily let you run very, very, very old software because it's not, not efficient enough. It doesn't want to work. And, con and conversely, the newest software won't run on the oldest machines because it does take advantage of some of the features that are in the new hardware. And so you always have this, you know, cat and mouse game or whatever you want to call it between hardware and software. And so in order to stay current, you have to do two things. You can either use your old uh, word perfect on your, on your initial PC or you can try to use, you know, Microsoft Office on your, your whiz bang new, you know, Dell whatever. And you, there's, there's very little uh, middle ground in between. Right. The item, maybe I, I'm not describing it well, is buying items online where you can't touch them until you actually uh, provided some money. Uh, and the support, they tell you, yes, it works with Apple stuff because that was and still is their largest community that's buying all of these items because they have no choice. They have one USB-C connection. Everything goes in and out through that. And if they don't have all of these other items, um, how, how, do, how do they get any work done? Uh, I mean, it's fine to, you know, just go read email, but you can't print anything. You can't display anything. Uh, I, I have to yet spend a little more time on that docking station. And by the way, afterwards, I found out if I should have bought a unit that already had a docking station, this is sort of a different, there's a connection uh, that's on the edge of the unit that goes to a different docking station, which I'm not going to buy. I, so on. So here it's just sharing with other people that don't be lulled into 
these items are great. They really are. I, I, you know, I love them. However, think of how you're, in other words, in addition to my CPU, the SSD, all of the internal stuff, how am I going to actually use this in a complete environment, which we haven't had to think about at all. It's always been there. It's like, you know, it, it's standard. And you find out that not quite. When they say, oh, well, it'll, you know, just a couple of bucks. No, no, the couple of bucks, uh, HP has done a nice job. When you put the two of them together and hook it all up, it does everything you expect it. And you only will get that from going back to the same vendor. So if you buy a Surface, you know, from Microsoft, wherever, whoever puts it together for them, you're going to be buying their docking station and so on. And it is an eye opener. In my case, I actually bought uh, a separate keyboard. I'm not going to sit there on the virtual keyboard and do editing and so on. I hook that up. It's Wi-Fi enabled, click, off I go, and everything works uh, as I expect. Um, so if anybody asks me how, you know, if they want any guidance, if not everybody wants guidance, I, I know how to do this and so on. Okay, it's how, how does one bring these up to someone that doesn't even want to listen to it? All they'll say, oh, it's got a USB-C connection. We can flip the thing upside down either way. You know, we're happy. Great. We don't have to look at it in the dark. It's done. Uh, it's, it's a hard sell to, that I found to get people to just think a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, and more to the point. Am I going to keep this machine for five years? And after five years, for all practical purposes, it's considered obsolete. Um, and I, I, I have my ideas. Um, maybe it sounds like nobody here is going to be buying anything. I was shocked more, most recently within the, uh, yeah, uh, within the month that said, hey, I try to buy all these machines and they're not available. They're all sold out. Everybody's at home. They bought them up. I was shocked. I wasn't paying attention. I'm paying attention now. So any, anyone here going to be buying any equipment like this in the near future? Ken says no. <laughs> well, in other words, we're going to use ours until they die. And then the day that they die, we're going to do what? Back to Jerome. I yes. think that, that because of the complexity, you, it, there's no way that you should be buying this stuff without doing a lot of research. That is the way it is. Because they, they and the manufacturer can't determine how you use the product, how long you want to use the product, what other technologies are going to come by, what, what are the competitors, they know the competitors. But it's too complicated for the manufacturer to figure out. Rather, they, there's no way that either you have to do the research or have a trusted IT person who can ask you the right questions for your own utilization to get, uh, to get you to the proper product. There's no way around it. It's just too complex to just walk in as like buying a box of cottage cheese in the store. There's three choices and you buy one. Well, it doesn't just, simply doesn't work that way in technology. Sorry. <laughs> well, most people only need to drive a sedan. They don't need to uh, play around with the engine and, and do race cars. But that depends on the person. That depends on the person. When before the engines get too complicated, people. before engines got too complicated, I used to work on an engine. I wanted a car that had an engine you could work on. That was just me. I wasn't telling it yeah. was for you. I was for me. So I did my. Yeah, you're, you're special, but but the, you know they, they're trying to satisfy the, the, the most people in the market. They most are. People like you. But it's but it, but each one each individual has to figure out their own particular work patterns, needs, technology, you know, issues. It's everybody's got to figure it out for themselves. And it's There's cheap. No, it's not, it, we're not spending you know five or ten thousand on computers anymore. No, but you're going to spend a number of hours working on it and figuring out what you need. That's what this session is for. Cindy, go ahead. The manufacturers are doing what they can do for them. And Mike, I can't hear you. You need to get closer to the microphone or something. Oh, All right. okay. can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I'll try that. I, mean, I, think, I think the manufacturers are doing what's easy for them. 
they don't want to have to, to do that because it's less and you know, put this in quote efficient. And that kind of efficiency is what's ruling the marketplace. Uh, or or their stock price. They could they could very well they got they're making tons of money. They could very well make some backwards compatible and put it the uh, the engineering if they wanted to. But they don't. And there are so few of them that they can get away with it. It's a, you know, it's an oligopoly now. Cindy? Um, yes, I just wanted to add that, uh, Mitch, I actually have a sedan that I like. It's a HP ProBook 450, and I've loved this computer. It's been great. It's a lot of uh, outlets, you know, USB outlets, extra ones. It's not thin. It's functional. It's mobile enough. But the greatest limiting restraint on my computer and why I have to get a new one is the battery. When it came time to replace the battery, HP stopped making the battery. It's about five years old, five to six years old. And I can't get a new battery. I, in fact, I finally got one, but I did a ton of research to get the battery that I got. And I could not get it for any help from HP. So it's in, I find it interesting, Bob, that you, you wrote that you like older computers. And still, there's some of these limiting factors that are very difficult to deal with. Yeah, I have a lot of devices that, that where the battery is the weakest part, be it uh, cordless phones or, or uh, older PCs and so on. Sometimes I'll, I'll find OEM on eBay to replace it that have a longer life, but a lot of the batteries that they, they sell are, are, are not functional or the manufacturer doesn't design the device like an Apple iPhone so that it's field replaceable on the battery. Yeah, yeah. and I... I did a search. I went to all these secondary sellers, and even at that level, and some of these sellers are really good, they advised me that it was going to be very difficult to find that battery. Well, it's not uh, just finding it, it's installing it on some of the devices. That's the big, that's the big issue, is that, is that once you can get parts, the, the stuff today isn't made the way original computers were, in that you could, you know, the old desktops, we all remember that. You take the cover off the back, and you got all this stuff that was interchangeable. Something worked, it didn't work, or whatever it is. You get a new gizmo, you take the old one out, you put the new one in, and bingo, you're back in business again. Today, they're all sealed. I mean, you, you, you take everything from the, the most inexpensive uh, laptop that we have, even the most expensive. There's nothing really replaceable in it of, of any real merit without a lot of work and, and a fair amount of technical knowledge. You know, Peter? Get the batteries. Go ahead, Bob. Um, the um, one of the entertaining uh, exercises that I did um, in the last year or so before I left Lexington is I got involved with the Lexington Refugee Assistance um, Project. And one of the things we had was a laptop drive. And that gave me a lot of experience in uh, replacing batteries on uh, non-replaceable battery laptops, uh, upgrading hard drives, upgrading memory. And the greatest resource out there is YouTube. If you want to know how to disassemble laptop made by manufacturer X model Y, just put it into Google. You'll find the YouTube video that will show you exactly step by step what you need to do to take the thing apart without breaking it and how to put it back together again, again, without breaking it. It's a great Remar remarkable, but you know, you don't want to go in there unless you have a little bit of mechanical and technical skill. Because otherwise, yeah. it's kind of like running reg edit if you don't know what you're doing. It's, uh, and the analogy I like to use is in some ways, it's like trying to disarm a nuclear weapon as the clock ticks down to zero and which wire do I cut? You better in the dark, it. in the dark, yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy. I mean, it can be done. All of us can be done. You know, yeah. not everybody knows how to solder. Not not everybody wants to know how to solder. And some of this stuff, you know, it's a required skill. And it's not just you know screwing something, pulling out the ribbon cable, and plugging the ribbon cable in and, and screwing it down. You know, yeah. at at the, those days are pretty much gone. Yeah. And it goes back to the manufacturing. The reason that come the technology is so inexpensive, relatively speaking, is that everything is all an integrated unit. You know, you 
you have an integrated unit that has everything on it. One thing breaks, you got to replace the whole integrated unit. You know, no more just replacing the CPU in your old computer. You got the, uh, you know, you got, you got a, a, a CPU board that has a lot of integrated stuff on it where you take that out and you put a new one in. Yep. You know, all the stuff when we had hair, you know, was very different. Uh, a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, Mitch, um, I think if you search enough on YouTube, you'll find not only a video that helps you replace the uh, the uh, cable on your um, uh, dryer, but another one that tells you how to make one. I bet you. Yep. Okay. Okay. Evie I, has I, a question. I have a comment. Actually, I overheard Cindy talking about HP, uh, her HP laptop, and a very hard to find uh, battery. Um, just so that I learned recently, HP business is going to be going, going, gone. So if you or anybody else who has HP laptop and needs some parts, it's probably good to get some right now because when eventually HP is gone, um, you might not get you know, much of anything. You, so you have to search on uh, YouTube or not YouTube, on <laughs> eBay for people that have. That's right, for the used part. So that's just one piece of information, letting people know. Thank you. I, I ended up at that time getting two batteries, and fortunately it's easy to replace. It wasn't like disarming a bomb, so I, I'm good. good. But I, I think it is time to are, get a new computer. Are you saying that there are other computers that it's like disarming a bomb? Apparently somebody said that. So. Char Charlie can probably speak to that, the bomb that sets fire to the... Uh... The, other, the other thing about the HP, too, is uh, the uh, uh, stories about them being sold or going under have, and being sold to Xerox and lots of other things, they've been circulating for a while. And I think HP is, this, is at the same mercy as a lot of other uh, vendors in, in that uh, they have a market and they have a market share and they're doing pretty well. And uh, they're going to continue to do okay for a while. But, you know, it's not like the old days where you had uh, various vendors with lots of strength. You know, it's, it's a competitive market. Lenovo is not going to go out of business. Acer is not going to go out of business. You know, all these, all these vendors are not going to go out of business. You know, and just, they're going to be there. So for something kind of trivial, uh, during the shutdown, I bought a Surface unit, actually two. And here it is. It's, I don't know if I can have it show up on camera or not. Yeah, well, your background's interfering, Jonathan. Okay, uh, let, me, uh, let me try to fix that. You're and disappearing. My here. surface <laughs> unit. Uh, <laughs> it's a uh, edit profile. Hmm. No, go on. There, next, there it next is. Next to the video camera, you can say uh, back, you can go uh, video. Click oh, the oh, carrot to the right of uh, Oh yeah. The to the okay. right of stop video. Kill the background. Choose virtual background. Thank you for the tech support. I'll have this in a second. There we go. There we go. The Much surface better. unit. And uh, it's uh, uh, it's needed for uh, uh, the sixty year old range. Uh, it uh, batteries don't last very long with it, uh, and uh, but it, you can't print from it. Uh, it's uh, old tech, definitely. Just just a. A silly it's water, it's it's waterproof. Jonathan, does it water come with matches? Uh, no, actually, it doesn't. Uh, it uh, it has actually more than uh, things have changed. Usually, surfaces nowadays have two connections, four, and uh, uh, that was hard to find. There was a lot of research needed to. Uh, well, that means it's twice yeah. as good, doesn't it? Sometimes, yeah. Yes. I have a I have a comment about uh, whoops. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah. Now, I have a, a comment about um, um, availability of software on the bike. Um, and I've had uh, a couple of experiences where I couldn't find necessary drivers or necessary firmware updates on vendors' USA sites. And in one case, about 10 years ago, I needed an NVIDIA driver for my wife's computer. I finally found it on the English language Sony Japan FTP site in a sub 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 directory. Um, yesterday, I met a saw a firmware update on a newly installed SSD drive. Um, basically, got corrupted owing to a defective Windows-based installer that our friends at Samsung 
uh, quality control department failed to catch. Um, and I needed to force the firmware update. Um, USA site did not have the standalone firmware updater anywhere. I found it on uh, Samsung South Africa. So, you know, when you can't find stuff, just because you can't find it in the USA doesn't mean it's not out there. It's a big planet. Hey, Bob, have, have you had any luck uh, using torrents to, uh, to find software like we used to use in the old days? Um, I, haven't done, I haven't used uh, torrents because I'm just concerned about malware. Yeah. Okay. And you don't know where torrents is torrenting from. And well, usually multiple sources anyway, right? Exactly. And you don't know, the more sources you're getting stuff from, the greater likelihood of corruption. And I, and I had already succeeded in corrupting the firmware on that drive using uh, Samsung's uh, software. And, what a whip. Uh, huh? yeah. What a whip. Yeah, well, you know, uh, if I hadn't been able to update it, I would have had to trash the drive and start over. Because, you know, if the drive controller is uh, corrupted, the drive becomes invisible. There we go. I Bye-bye, drive. There we go. Can I ask, Steve, two items? Um, one, you've used uh, or you've brought to meetings uh, before all this uh, pandemic. Um, I think it's an Apple uh, laptop. Is that one that has one I.O. or is it complete? You know, uh, uh, in other words, is it like the old type where you pretty much have everything on board? And if you were looking for another machine, would you go out and buy a current Apple machine with only one I.O. connector? Or are you might you be thinking along the lines of some other company, uh, like back to Windows or... I know you have a plethora of machines. I also have a plethora of machines, which, well, hey, it is what it is. Well, well, we'll have to see if my story. plethora is bigger than I your have, plethora. Um, I have, and, uh, Steve, Steve uh, uh, Charlie's, try, uh, Charlie's trying to talk too. So one of you two, one of you two guys decide who's talking. Can we have Steve, please? And then sure. Charlie afterwards. Go ahead, okay. Steve. Uh, I... I switched over to MacBook about a year ago uh, because I was frustrated with the blue screens I was getting on my one computer uh, with Windows. And there was one software I would run, and as soon as I ran it, the machine would go blue screen. So then I decided to explore a MacBook. Now, the MacBook I got has four USB-C ports on it. And uh, uh, what I have on one side is an extender that gives me four more USB ports and a uh, an HDMI port. I also bought a USB to HDMI, USB to USB 3. Uh, USB 3, is that the right one? So I can uh, have a, a, a drive mounted on all the time. Um, uh, I do have uh, Linux machines. I have one right over here. That's my second machine. And uh, I have another Linux downstairs. I've, you know, um, I, I also... Um, Evie has a Windows 10. She refuses to go to Linux, but that's her choice. And uh, um, I have a Surface, but if I was going to buy another, it'd probably be an Apple. The other quick question before I uh, jump in has to do with SMART, S-M-A-R-T. When we had hard drives, uh, we could get the smart data if we knew what we were looking for and would tell us whether our disks were on our way out. And the new SSD, I think this is something that Steve brought up, and I'm not sure if anybody has any information. In other words, if we can get the smart data, um, you know, I've seen them on Apple. They just, they, they just copy it and they say it's healthy or not healthy, but you get no details. If anyone has any information, I'd like to hear about it or talk about it offline. Um, in other words, on the software, it's like, okay, I got a new machine. Uh, how's it doing? Is it on the way out? In other words, some of the really low cost SSDs are the ones that you, the people are running into trouble and um, so on. I turn the floor over to the other Charles. Mr. Holbro. 
or Dr. Holbro. Which is, I have a, I have a MacBook Pro from early 2011. So it's an aged machine. I've replaced the battery. I've, re, I've done a couple of other things on it. It's a wonderful machine. I was a Windows guy up until I bought this machine. I had to put a hub on it. I have a six port USB hub. I run, I think I have four external hard drives running on it. Uh, uh, I have no other machines. I have to maintain my wife's PC, which is just a pain in the butt. Uh, and uh, I would I would go out and buy another one. I mean, this I like this one because it still has a CD reader in it, uh, and you know it's a it's a great machine. So I'm 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 converted from PC to Apple. You're not alone. I uh, I'm in a heterogeneous household. My uh, my bride has an Apple machine. She loves it. I have a PC, but I have uh, lots of Apple peripheries. So uh, I guess I'm an equal opportunity bigot. Well, I I call myself bilingual. But that's there we go. Yeah. I I was hesitant uh, to switch over to uh, Mac. Uh, for many years, I figured Windows was the only thing that you could use to get the work done uh, in the software engineering industry. Uh, in other other industries that I've worked in. And then I worked for this one company and I found out that the majority of the software engineers were using a MacBook. And so I started paying attention to it. And, and that was the thing that led me into it because while I had originally thought Macs were only good for, you know, uh, producing movies and editing uh, pictures, I found that it, it can do everything uh, that I could do on my Windows machine. Well, especially if you know a little uh, Linux, because uh, I mean, there are things that I want to do. I just go down into the machine and, and, and do it there. Uh, Steve, wh why did these software engineers prefer the Mac? I think it's just because they like the interface for it. Uh, one thing, you know, there's a couple of things that I really like about the, the, the MacBook. I'll tell you just a couple of them. Uh, uh, on the top of the screen, it tells me today's date, uh, then it's a Wednesday. I mean, you, you think that's uh, strange. But when you're, you're waking up every day into exactly the same environment, Groundhog Day style, <laughs> it's nice to see, hey, the computer's telling me it's today's Wednesday. Okay, fine. Another is that I can go on my screen and I can swipe with three fingers like this and go to different desktops and have different environments working on, uh, working uh, at the same time. And I found that they don't interfere with each other. When I was on the, the Windows machine, if I'm running one program and it's a memory hog, okay, and a lot of them are, that I really couldn't do anything else on the machine. I had to walk away and do something else someplace else. Well, here, I can be uh, producing a video which uses a great deal of resources, swipe the screen, do sourcing, uh, do um, surfing, rather, uh, edit documents, update the wiki page, and all that at the same time, uh, and not know that there's this big process going on in the background. That's been my experience. The, 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 the only, the only uh, uh, comment I would make on that is that uh, sometimes you're uh, comparing apples and oranges. If you take a brand new MacBook or brand new Apple and a brand new Windows-based machine, the features and, and, and stuff are, can, can sometimes be minimal. You get, uh, you get the touchscreen on the Apple devices, on the Windows-based devices, which is comparable to the Apple. You get a, a lot of other things. The, if you have enough memory on the machine that's comparable to uh, what's going on with the Apple, you can get the same kind of performance. I'm not. I'm not selling. I'm not selling Windows-based machines. I'm just saying my experience is that when you really compare apples to apples, the whole e uh, environment and, and ecosystem is seeming to converge. Apple was there first with a lot of interesting stuff, and I think other p and especially usability. And I think the rest of the world is converging on that and becoming more more like Apple. And Apple has picking up taken some of the uh, better features of Windows and incorporated that as well. And we're becoming more homogeneous as opposed to heterogeneous as we were many, many years ago. One person's opinion. I think you're right, Peter, but I think you're not comparing apples and oranges. You're comparing apples and PCs. I'd Thank like you very much with a smile on my face. Yeah, I'd like to throw the floor open to anyone else that's... Um, a participant uh, in the audience that has questions or so on, where we've got some time left here uh, for the meeting. Uh, yeah, Steve, yeah. does that can sound I, right? 
No. Can, can I ask yeah, you a quick, we, que quick question about how do you protect yourself? I saw the, the power strip, but, but how do you protect yourself against the actual overheating of your power supplies? That's, uh, uh, in other words, it's called uh, unanticipated situation. You can't. In other words, it's like, how can I anticipate problems with my car? You can't. However, getting... Um, I've talked to other people that have nothing to do with computers, but have plugged things in. And normally the actual connection to the wall, that connection doesn't really, really heat up uh, unless you're drawing so much huge amounts of power that, you know, your breaker on the uh, power panel should, you know, should uh, release and uh, that, that portion, uh, that problem should go away. There is no answer. In other words, you, you do you take all the precautions you possibly can. And one possible precaution is you, you move stuff that you didn't have there before that are plugged in that can provide unintended heat and combustion to whatever's nearby. Uh, you can only do so much. But this other specific item that they never thought about and the fellow turning around and half of this kitchen is on fire. That was, you know, that was in the news. I mean, you know, that, that's not a made up story. And as we buy more equipment, we need to think a little bit more, but how many of us really, you know, we're not experts in all areas. We, we do the best we can. And some of us, and even I've done it too. Oh, I know better than everyone else. And when I look back, I say, geez, shouldn't have done that. You know, so <laughs> I have buyer's remorse. But does the transformer yeah, inevitably get hot? Just information for everybody. We're about five minutes over so that okay. uh, if you want to, we can, we can stay on. But if you want to, if you want to politely leave, uh, don't feel <laughs> obligated. Uh, you know, you, you, one, one thing you can do is get in the habit of putting your hand right near all of that electronic feel how hot, just feel how hot it is. Another solution Although, is, 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 is a little more complicated. Uh, I have them. They make combined USB and AC outlets for the wall so that you can plug your phone right into the wall, if you will. And therefore, you have, uh, don't have to go through a power strip or, or other things, even for multiple devices. We have one that uh, we use that has two uh, USB ports on it and two AC outlets. And that's uh, ample and sufficient to charge uh, our devices at the same time. I thought so that's, that that's a little more expensive and a little, little more, uh, little more, uh, whatever. I thought that some of these power strips were supposed to conserve energy also, and that was one of the reasons why uh, the green people were really pushing some of the power strips. Is that true? They do. They burn. That's why they conserve energy. <laughs> <laughs> Now, some, some of them will sense the power draw from one of the outlets, and if there's no power draw there, it'll shut down the devices that are connected to the other outlets. That's the green energy right. feature. Uh -huh. right. that yeah. What you would do, for, yeah, for what you would do, for example, is plug your, uh, your PC mainframe into the, the outlet that's got the current sensing, and then plug your peripherals into the controlled other outlets so you turn off your your main pc and this power strip senses there's no current draw any longer there and so it shuts down the power to all the peripherals okay printers, unless you're on the laptop whatever. or the pc and it goes to sleep and then you're in trouble <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> and i've yeah. done that guilty <laughs> Uh, also, about the kitchen fire, I would make the comment, it strikes me there must have been an electrical fault that developed there somewhere. That certainly the manufacturers of these little power boxes uh, are required to design them so that the exterior temperature uh, is not going to set something else on fire. There must have been a component failure within, maybe a shorted turn or something. Um, I think they're probably even designed so that they won't overheat with a short circuit applied to the output, or at least it depends they upon the quality of the device. Correct? It does. It d depends entirely upon the quality of the design and the quality of the components that are in it. <clears throat> but I think there must have been a, an electrical fault that developed. 
Cindy, you have a comment? Uh, just a quick question. If I, after the discussion, if I were to go from PC by go to Mac and then transfer all the data, even if it's by somebody else, is that complicated or not? Is it a steep learning curve? Or how I did it a work? year ago. I did it a year ago and it was not a problem at all. Okay. The, uh, uh, what I did was I, I had all my files on an external disk and I connected them up to the Mac and was able to bring them across. Now, do I have to pay to get the Microsoft Office? Uh, no, I found LibreOffice. Um, I don't, you know, so I'm saying that I could find software available on a Mac, and I don't think I've had to pay for any of it yet. Then it's all yeah. doing the stuff that I need to do. And I'm talking about even my video editing software. I got that for free. I wasn't able to do that on the PC. But I found that the move from a, a PC to a uh, MacBook was uh, very easy. The... Uh, you can write it out on a uh, PC, write all your files on a PC, and you can read them on a Mac. If you do them EXFAT instead of uh, NTFS, you can read and write on the, from the Mac. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I go back and forth between my wife's machine and my machine fairly fluently. It's, it's not difficult at all. I'm getting back to the power strip issue. Uh, that, that power cube that was used, I don't know what it is, but... Um, one it makes me think that one really ought to look for UL rated um, power devices. I, I probably yes. there are a lot of them that are not there, but the underwriters lab test these things. And there's yes, also stuff that may not be UL rated that says it is that comes from uh, parts unknown. Actually, yes, from a, UL, a UL rating is a good idea. And le unless, it, unless, it's, uh, unless it's a fake UL rating. Right. And who knows? You know, it, you know it is, is, uh, as Charlie said early on, caveat emptor, buyer beware. Mm -hmm. the, the only way you can know if something really works is, is t in this current environment, we can't talk to people, is do your research. Look at the reviews for the, for the product. Look at the person selling the product. If there's... If there's if they've sold a billion of them, they've been around for a long time and they have a high rating and the product is highly rated on multiple sources by brand, then you have a fairly good uh, chance that it's a reasonable product. If it's something out of uh, somebody's garage that a kid, high school kid made as a science project, then, you know, you know, you get what you pay for. Nothing against high school kids, by the way. <laughs>